Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Now, this is a special board game review because this is a Moonshell by Unfiltered Games. Not to be confused with Unfiltered Gamer, this is actually our publishing company. This is our first game we ever made, and because of that, this review video is more of like a preview video. It has biases in it. I helped publish this game. My wife designed it. So, I'm mainly going to be talking about uh, how the game looks and like what it does and uh, the, how you play the game, and then I'll, I'll give my critiques on my own game. I think it'll be fun, and it's also a way in which I can promote it a bit, and give you guys a discount code at the end of the video. So if you're interested in picking the game up, there'll be a, a good chunk of a discount. So we're almost out of games. We'd like to just get rid of the rest of these. We're not gonna be republishing this game. This is a one and done type of a thing. So if you're looking for a game like this, then maybe stick around, listen to what I have to say, and then check it out if you'd like. Moonshell is a puzzle mermaid game. This is a game that kind of feels like, I'd say, Sagrada and Azul. And in fact, I'm sure my wife had some kind of like enlightenment in regards to at least Sagrada. She loves puzzle games, she loves mind and thinky games, and she also wanted a game featuring uh, female mermaids as well as the ability to play with not only your friends and game group for adults, but also for kids. This game is customizable to where you can play with a younger audience, and I mean a much younger audience, all the way up to where you can play with gamers like probably the people who are watching this video, my audience. Uh, this is a game that has three actions, and you're basically going to be pulling and uh, collecting and placing down uh, seashells on to a treasure board. This treasure board is going to be asking you to complete different types of patterns that you're going to be getting in the game, and every game is going to be different with different types of patterns. The pattern might be to have all of a certain type of shell on the bottom, or to have the most of a certain type of shell or color of a shell, and it's always going to be changing. There's five different ones and a personal objective. We're going to go ahead and cover the basic setup for the base game, and then I'll explain each of the intricacies that you can add to the base game to make it more complex and then I will discuss the advanced mode along with the expansion, our Lunar Reef expansion, which is all included in the base game. We didn't want to do two separate boxes. We don't want to have people paid for two separate products. We wanted to just put it all into one game and give you every little idea that we could come up with to make Moonshell a fun game. And hopefully you'll have fun with it. But we'll talk about that right now, and uh, then we'll go ahead and talk about uh, how to play the game. All right, so we got to talk about setup first before we go into all the intricacies. And, and the first thing is, let's just discuss the game as though it's three or four players, because they, those both don't change, and then I'll talk about the changes. When you're playing a three or four player game, the first thing you'll do is take the main game board and place it out within reach of all players. You'll make sure that all of the tiles is, are going to be placed into this bag here. Now all the tiles are basically going to be the seashell tiles. You won't put any of the other tiles in the game, the clownfish and the anemone, uh, the moonshell token, or even the sea urchin tokens. Those are going to be set aside. Uh, after you've gone ahead and put them all in there, you're going to shuffle them all up in the bag and throw them down onto the grid. We have a 5x5 five five grid here, and you're going to just place them on the field. It doesn't matter if they're face up or face down, they're double sided. Then you're going to give every single player one of these treasure boards. These treasure boards are a four by three and they have their actions as to what you can do on your turn printed on the very top portion of the board. Additionally, each player is going to take a mermaid. This mermaid is going to be the color of the player as well as possibly an active or passive ability that they can choose and they're going to get a mermaid meeple. Additionally, you'll take out this token here. This is an even or odd token. Just simply leave it on the even side and place it next to the game board. Then, each player is going to take a special objective. These are the pink cards. Uh, they are one and done. So you'll draw two of them from the deck. You'll make sure this deck is nice and shuffled, and then give everybody two of these cards here. From there, they're going to select one of these cards as their secret private objective that only they can score points for. These are large objectives, they're challenging, and they give you a high point value if you're able to complete them. And you don't have to complete them or any of the objectives if you don't want to. The top right-hand side of the card is going to tell you how many points you get. The top right hand side is what the card is. If there is a seahorse that indicates how many times you can do this, and this card for instance has one seahorse, so you may only attempt to complete this once, no more. And then the bottom and middle are a image description and a written description of how it is completed. So in this case here, this one has a three by two and it shows you square images of all colors, which means it all has to be the same shape, but those shapes can be any color. So for instance, it could be four of a uh, auger and it doesn't matter the color of those guys. 
after you've gotten one of these guys and you discarded the other, you should go ahead and remove the pink deck from the game. You're not going to use it again this game. Then you'll take each of the five decks. There's pink, purple, red, green, and blue. And you'll shuffle them each individually. And then you'll take one card from each of them and set it up next to the game board within reach eyesight of all players. These are each a different type of objectives that you can score. Uh, one of them is going to be a uh, pattern with certain colors. Another is going to be a trove, which is the player with the most of a certain type of shell or color of a shell will score points. Another is going to be a composition, which is a slightly more challenging, similar to your secret objective type of thing you need to secure, whether it be augers in a certain way or whether whether it be uh, sand dollars in a certain way. Um, then we have the collector. You'll get a point for every single one of the different types of things on your game board, whether it be one point for every green shell or one point for every uh, a type of uh, starfish, etc. And the last one is pairs. These are just pairs of either colors or shells, depending on which one you get. And you'll get two points for each one. And so you'll basically just have one of each of these guys. So five total cards face up revealed and one pink card secretly with yourself. Then, after that, you're basically ready to begin the game. Now, a few other caveats for setup. If you're playing with a two-player game, you're actually going to take eight of these uh, sea urchins, they're the nasty little sea urchins, and you're going to add them to the bag uh, be uh, before you start the setup or after, depending on how you'd like the board state to be. It really doesn't matter. It's actually all up to you. Additionally, if you would like, you can include a moon shell. A moon shell is a, a special unique tile that is a wild that you can use once and add it to your game board. Uh, and it's going to go on your mermaid board. This is kind of like a bonus that tile that you can either use or not use and gain points if you don't use it. Then there's bonuses as well uh, as far as your mermeeples go. You can choose to play with no mermaids for an easier, younger audience, a simpler game, or a mermaid. There's the light side and the dark side. The light side is actually an easier mode for the game, and the dark side is actually a little more complex, so it goes from very simple to slightly more complex to extra complex. And these guys are going to include a mermaid, that you, mermeeple here, that you're going to actually be utilizing, dropping on the board and off of the board. Uh, the other little aspects to set up that if you'd like to add is the Lunar Event deck. As far as the other pieces to set up, if you want, you can play with the Advanced deck. I suggest that you do not mix them, but you can if you want, making it an even more complex game or challenging game, but it just comes with extra objectives. The way you tell the difference between the base game and the expansion is in the bottom right hand corner of each of the cards is going to be a little fish. And that fish is going to symbolize that it's a bonus card that you can either use. You can switch this deck out for one of the of the decks, so I can switch orange for orange or purple for purple, or I can just be cheeky and add them all together. All right, the solo mode. So the solo mode is played in the same way for setup where you're gonna go ahead and place out everything on the game board, get your chests and get your mermaid. But instead of another player, you're actually just gonna take this little deck here. It's gonna have a reference card and then you're gonna have these five cards here. You'll shuffle these five cards up, place them across from you, leave the reference within reach so that you can see it, and you'll begin the game that way. Yeah, it's actually that simple. There are a few different extra solo modes you can choose to play that make it more complex, which are explained in the rule book. Okay, so let's talk about how to play Moonshell and then all the different pieces of content that you can add. Just remember to take this in bits and bytes. It'll make it a lot easier to understand that way. So I've set it up. I've got exactly what it would look like if you were playing the game along with the game board. There are the five different objectives that are all unique in their own way. There's your coin, which will determine which way the board is going to rotate. There's your bag of shells, and then you've got your uh, treasure chest and your mermaid, along with your mermeeple, your moon shell, and the objective card. So I actually took two of these, I chose one, I discarded the other. So this is what you're going to have left over. And how the game works is pretty simple. You'll select a player, and that player is going to be the last person to visit a lake, river, or ocean, or maybe just jump in a pool or a pond, I guess, and they're going to begin. This game is played in uh, turns and rounds. On your turn, you are going to get to take three actions, and you can take these actions in any order. There are three different choices, and you can take one three times, or you can mix them up however you'd like. The first action you can take, if you'd like, is rotate. You can rotate the board based on where the coin is rotating towards, clockwise or counterclockwise. When it is even, it is going counterclockwise, and when it is odd, it is going uh, clockwise. So, in this case here, if I wanted to, I could rotate the board 90 degrees counterclockwise. And that would be one of my three actions. 
The next action that you can take is pulling two shells. You can take any two shells from any of the columns, and there's five columns, and it's only going to be in front of you. So I'm facing this way, my other opponent would be here. If I had another player, I'd be here, another player could be over here. And so it's only going to be where you are focused on in your specific way in which you're sitting. So I could take two shells, I'll pull them down and place them into the slots that are represented by rocks. In order to use this action though, neither of these spaces can be filled. If one space is filled, you cannot do it. And if both spaces are filled, you definitely can't do it. Then you're going to pull the shells that are remaining on the game board closer to you, freeing up two spaces. From there, you're going to take two shells from the bag and place them down into the remaining empty slots. And that's it. That's all pull two is. So you rotate the void as an action and you pull as an action. The last action you can take is collecting. You may only collect shells if they are on the rock spaces and only if those rock spaces are facing you. You can choose either one and when you pick one, you'll take it and place it in one of the four columns on your treasure chest. From there, after you've chosen the column, just like the game Tetris, that shell is going to slide down as far as it can go. If there's another shell that is blocking its path, it will stop. So if the entire bottom row is filled, it's going to go to the second slot and it will not continue pushing them down. This functions just like the Tetris idea. If you've ever played Tetris and you'll understand that these guys just fall. You select the column and it goes do 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 and it falls down. And that is the last action. So rotate and then pull two, which you cannot pull one or anything else and it has to have empty spaces. And then the last one is collect. Take one of these guys and place it. Now, if you already have shells in front of you, you can start by collecting one or both of them. You could choose to, instead of rotate, just pull and collect both of those tiles. But just remember that you get three of these actions and you can choose them in any order that you would like. After you've selected your actions and you have none left, your turn is over and you'll pass it to the next player. And that person will take their three actions. And that's the game. That's the very basic idea of this game. You take those actions, you utilize them as best as you can, and you fill your board. Well, why are you doing this? Well, because each of the cards that are laid out face up in front of the game board are going to have a unique objective. Like this trove here says that the player with the most white shells at the end of the game will score six points. And if players are tied, everybody will get six points. Or the array. The array says that the pattern, this is a pattern with orange shells and it may be flipped or, 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 or um, shifted as long as it makes this pattern here. And it doesn't matter what type of shells, just so long as they're orange. And the collector, you'll get a point for every single clamshell you have on your game board or pairs of purple and white and so on and so forth. So every game is going to be focusing yourself on trying to complete these objectives and your secret objective. If you can complete this big boy here, you can get a bunch of points and you can combine them along with any of the objectives you see face up on the field. The game is going to end when somebody's board is filled. Once somebody's board is filled, then everybody should have equal turns. So if I started and the person to my left is the one who finished, then the next two players are going to finish the round and no one else gets a turn. You're going to add up points. And the points are going to be based on the top left hand side of each of the objective cards, including your secret one. And whoever has the most points is the winner. That's, that's it. It's a very basic idea of the game and it's a way you can play with younger um, kids, you can play with young teens, and, and you can, you can uh, basically advance from there. Let's talk about all the bonus stuff now, okay? The first bonus I want to talk about is the moon shell, which I talked to you about the setup. This is a shell you can add to your mermaid and you'll just leave it on the game board. And as a collect action, instead of taking one from one of these spaces here on the rocks in front of you, you can collect your moon shell. And just like anything else, you'll choose a column and then you'll place it down and you will have it slide down until it hits another shell or the bottom of your treasure chest. This shell is special. This shell is a wild color and a wild shell type, and it can be all of them for every objective. So in the case of a trove looking for white, this will count as a white. And in the case of clamshells, where you're looking for clamshells, this is a clamshell too. Do you need it to be a purple when it comes to pairs? Yes, you can do that as well. And you'll score points at the end of the game if you just choose not to use it. So if you're able to make a perfect board and you don't need this shell, you might as well keep it. It'll score you more points and it has in a lot of cases ended up having somebody win the game by them not utilizing it. It's a small bonus, but it's one that's I think pretty cool and it's kind of the basis idea of the game. The next bonus that we can add to the game, if you'd like, is the mermaids and the mermeeple. I'm going to include the mermeeple with each of the mermaids. The first one we'll talk about is the active 
and the second one we'll talk about is the passive power. Active powers are basically going to allow you to change one of the three different actions. And the way it works is pretty simple. As long as you have your mermeeple uh, next to you, you can then choose to perform the action on the bottom left of your mermaid. For instance, this one here is my Hawaiian mermaid, and it says that uh, the action is tideful. It says, pull the frontmost tiles from two adjacent columns into the open rock space in front of you. So you can take this mermaid and you can place it either on the side of the game board or on the mermaid itself, just so long as you know that the mermaid has been played, and then you can perform the action. So for instance, if my board looked like this, instead of pulling two from a single column going down, now I can take one from any two adjacent columns and pull them down. And then you'll slide everything down, and then you'll go ahead and add these more shells. And each of the different active mermaids are going to do something like this. So it changes how you can gather shells in the game and or rotate and, of course, all the ability to collect. When you choose to use the mermaid, you've placed it out, you've taken the action. It still counts as one of your three actions. And you cannot take this guy off until the end of your next turn. So I next turn will come around, I'll take my actions, then she will come back to me. To which case I can play her ability once every other turn. The other option is if you want, you can play the passive side. Now what I suggest is everybody either chooses to play passive or, or chooses to play active mermaids, as opposed to everybody choosing different ones. I guess you could, it's really customizable, but it's probably better for gameplay that you just choose one side for everybody. The passive side is going to allow you to do the same thing. You'll take the mermaid, you'll place it out. This is a bonus action, but it doesn't involve rotating, pulling, or collecting. Like, for instance, Tide Pool Now, with the Dark Hawaiian Mermaid, says that you may place your mermeeple onto, uh, onto a tile in the water. No one else can now collect it. At the end of your next turn, you could take her off, and people could then collect that tile. But what's nice about this passive aspect is that if you choose not to remove it, you can choose to leave it on the game board. And that helps for two things, either the power and also this coin here. And that's how passives and actives work. The coin we'll talk about now. Coins say even and odd. If it is even, the board will rotate one way. If it's odd, it'll rotate the other way. And that's gonna be based on the amount of mermaids that have been used. So mermaids that are either A, placed on the mermaid, or placed on the board here, are gonna be included in this total. Zero counts as even, so zero and two and four, it'll be on the even side, and one and three will be on the odd side. And whenever mermaids come off, this is going to flip the coin and change the way the board rotates. And that's basically how all the mermaid powers work. Uh, the next things that you can choose to add to the game is A, more sea anemones, or, or sorry, more sea urchins, which are just nasty little buggers that can kind of mess the game up. Typically speaking, those sea urchins are just added to the end of the game, basically when this bag runs out of tiles, if it ever does, you'll just add these guys to it. And then you also have the expansion stuff. Expansion portion number one is the clownfish and the uh, sea anemones. Uh, these guys you can add number of players plus one. So in a three player game, you will add four of these clownfish and four of the anemones into the bag, at the start of the game. And they work just like every other shell, except the only thing that's unique about them is whenever you place one of them onto your game board, wherever they land, the next time you get the opposite, so if you have a sea urchin and you get a clownfish, you'll just need to take the clownfish and place it directly on top of that enemy. Or you'll make sure that if you have the clownfish already on the game board and you have your anemone, you'll take the anemone and slide it underneath the clownfish. So the clownfish is always facing up on the anemone. And this will score you bonus points at the end of the game. It's a little stacking feature that kind of changes the game just a little bit. Then there is the Lunar Reef expansion. This, like we already explained, is an event deck. And at the beginning of every round, the first player's turn, you can go ahead and draw one of these and perform its action or gain a bonus. So it's a nice little nifty way of kind of increasing the speed of the game and also changing the complexity of the game as well. And then, of course, like I said for the setup, there's extra cards that you can just add to the game. And that's pretty much all the different complexities that you can choose to add. You can choose to add one or another or none of it 
or maybe just the event deck, and you can push your youngins to kind of learn the game and improve along the way and make it a little more of a mind-bendy type of game for them. But that was the idea of the game, is to have it a type of game that you can start off playing with younger audiences, and then progressively as they get older, or just as they get a little more keen to understand in the game, you can just add all the little extra complexities. And then for us gamers like me, we just throw it all together and you got a decently complex puzzle game. Now, it's still not crazy competitive, complex, but it's got a little bit more meat to it. And yeah, okay, there you go. That is the setup, that is how to play, and all the little additions that we put into the game. So now I just want to kind of talk about the game, gush about some of the things I really liked, and talk about some of the things I really didn't like, and uh, leave it up to you if you want to pick up the game. And I'll have a code, like I said, at the end of the video where you can go, just go ahead and, and pick up the game. And if you already want to, you can just head to the end of the video and get the code. <laughs> okay, let's talk about it. So I've been reviewing games for almost a decade now and uh, going through a lot of games on Kickstarter and now GameFound, any self-published titles. Uh, I heard a lot of stories about all the people who designed games and the complexities and the trials and tribulations and how shipping can end up or taxes can end up or um, seizure, seizure of different pieces. It was just crazy. And like, I always felt really bad for these people and I wanted to kind of get an idea of what it took in the, in the eyes of a game designer or publisher to make a product become reality. And it was also a good way, considering that I review games a lot, like I want to know what's actually put into this stuff and how challenging it is and what you need to do and what's the process. Because I feel like judging something without ever having like done it or understanding the process, well, you don't need to make a game to review a game, I promise you that. You can just play a game and determine if you like it or not and that's fine, but I want to understand the process and like what it takes and what challenges there are and like are these some of these things I complain about are they even worth complaining about how much more complicated would it have been to do and so with this kind of gave me a little bit like a small gleaming as to like what it was like to make a game and um, it was also a really cool way to have my wife come up with an idea and I wanted to kind of fulfill that so that she could have something in her name that she made that may last you know I don't know a long time hopefully which would be kind of cool so that was kind of the idea behind Moonshell. She took out a small game board. It was literally like this big. It was like one, one tenth the size of the actual game board now. And she took out a bunch of little pieces of paper and she cut out these shells and she was just sitting there in her room. And she walked up to me one day and she had this kind of little prototype that was made that was like at a cardboard at this point in time. And she showed me, she's like, is this a game concept you think people will like? And so we played a little round of it and it was very, very basic. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. The board rotates, and I like the idea of it having this Tetris type of a feel, and it has this kind of, um, oh, what's the word, that old app, the Candy Crush, the Candy Crush. And it feels kind of like both of those games put together in a board game. And it's not too complex where somebody young can't pick it up, or somebody that's kind of new to the industry, or maybe maybe it's like a guy that gets a new girlfriend, and she wants, he wants to bring it into a really cool like hobby that is ours. And this is kind of a cool gateway game that I think would work really well with that. So we decided to publish it. We found an artist in Canada, and she was wonderful, and I just love the artwork, which is a very unique style of artwork that I don't see on a whole lot of games, kind of like a modern-ish, it like, took me a while to get on board with it because it was so unique to me as far as the type of games I enjoy. And also, I'm not a puzzle gamer. I don't play puzzle games that much. I've, I've come around to them now by not only making this game and playing other puzzle games that I've kind of started to slowly enjoy more and more, but I was never a big puzzle gamer. And this has kind of pushed me to like be a little bit more interested and in, uh, involved in like using my mind a bit more because it's very complex trying to figure out where everything goes and planning ahead in this type of way. And it was, I just wasn't very good at it. So that was kind of the backstory with like what made us decide to pick up the game and, and why it would be kind of cool. And so we added a bunch of mermaids from all around the world that I thought would be cool representing a bunch of different people. And then we wanted to add a bunch of different complexities to the game that nothing took too com was ever too complex to add one thing to, but it was enough to where even the more hardened gamers could enjoy playing with somebody who was a little bit newer uh, to board games. Uh, I loved playing this game. We played this, I played this hundreds of times. The scores were always very close and it felt really cool to like slowly progress with the different cards, decide what type of cards worked and which ones didn't. And my crazy ideas, like that I was just throwing around out there with how you could make the board and add all this extra stuff to it was, was really fun. Um, and some of them just outlandish or impossible or maybe just impossible because of the amount of money. And overall, the Kickstarter experience was great. There was a lot of great stuff involved with this game. We'll do some of the pros I really enjoyed about this game. 
Um, the first pro of this game is I love rotating boards. I think it's very unique. I haven't seen a lot of games do this. And I love the addition of Candy Crush meets Tetris attached to a board game. The other thing I really like is there's not a lot of board games that are mermaid themed. There's one, I think it's called Mermaid Island and it's for little, little, little kids. And this is the only adult mermaid game or, you know, kids to adult mermaid game that I've seen out there in the market. And I thought that was a really cool untapped potential. And so I really thought it was a cool idea to make something like this. What I also loved about this was being able to choose everything that involved the quality of the game. I wanted the box to be extra thick, sturdy, and not something that's ever going to be messed with. And this thing is a beast. And I like that. I also like that all of our boards are triple thick. Like this, these boards here, you're not going to get anything that's that's thin. There's a lot of these companies that make smaller product and I never, I understand the cost ratio, but this was really wasn't about cost for me. So I wanted like really strong, good cardboard that was going to last a long time. Um, and so I be, being able to do that and add that to the process is nice. Being able to have the canvas, have the rule book the way I wanted it to look. It was just a really cool aspect to the game. I love the mermaids and being able to come up with the powers and try and balance them. And some people might say they're not all balanced. Maybe the Hawaiian one is my favorite. So maybe there's a slight power increase there. Um, but they're all really, really close. And the games always come down very close as well. Um, and so, yeah, those are the main things I really liked about the game. Uh, a few of the little qualms I have is A, it's a puzzle game. So it took me a while to get into it. And I was playing lots and lots of this puzzle game, which I mean, I guess kind of brought me into the puzzling community, I suppose. Um, I wasn't, a, I, I made the solo mode. That's probably my main contribution other than just the little expansion portions to the game. Uh, this expansion, that is the solo mode portion to the expansion, works pretty well as an AI player. It's something that you can add to a two player game or a three player game, or if you're playing by yourself, it's basically just gonna change the board as you collect shells to try and get the highest score. Don't expect anything too crazy with the solo mode of the game. If you're just picking this up for the solo mode, I made it. I'm telling you, it's probably not the greatest, but it's not a bad way in which you can play sort of like a, a, a phone game that's like, you know, like Candy Crush uh, uh, and it's kind of gives you this little change. And you can also increase the types of, um, complexities to the solo mode if you'd like. And also Clinton Morris, who all, he also helped me to design Hunt the Raven, Ravenger. Um, he helped me design the solo mode as well. It's like a, it was like a team effort. The insert. There's certain things about this insert that drove me nuts. The fact that you can't dig your finger all the way in and get all the cards. It's something I've learned. I, I'll learn from so that it doesn't happen again. Um, and just the other thing that drove me nuts is getting these cards right. Some of them, the way in which you place every little thing. If you miss out on one thing, it can be a disastrous thing. And it took us a long time to put all that stuff together. But overall, the game came out really well. I think a lot of people really enjoyed it. I didn't hear a lot of people say it was too, you know, negative. Uh, I think everybody who likes puzzle games is gonna really enjoy this game. And I've seen some really cool things people have done with the game. And the most recent thing I saw was about a week ago where people took all these shells and got rid of them and added actual seashells or actual little sand dollars or starfish. And that was that was really cool. I Callie got very excited about that. I thought that was a cool idea for the game. And the deluxe lazy Susan that lets you rotate the board without having to uh, pick it up and rotate it was really nice. There was a uh, sandbox gaming who helped us make the, the deluxe version. I think we only have a very few left. It might be still on the, the website, um, but that was a really cool aspect to the game. A few thank yous before we get into my goodbye. Uh, first one is Vince from Lucky Duck Games. He gave us a lot of creativity and assistance with understanding the process. Everybody from Cephalothair, they did a great job in helping us explain how the uh, shipping the games out and distribution worked. Uh, Man vs. Meeple for just the help along the way and encouragement, as well as I think they did some videos for us as well. And Peter uh, from uh, Cardboard Alchemy. Uh, he helped well, quite a bit, especially during the stressful times on the Kickstarter. Kickstarters can be actually pretty st stressful, surprisingly. And uh, being able to kind of give us these tips and hints, and there's all kinds of stuff that you can learn from all these wonderful people in the industry that are so much more knowledgeable than me when it comes to publishing board games. So a big thank you to all those people. And of course, everybody who helped us make the game. Clinton and Brian, our graphic designer, couldn't have done this without him. And uh, yeah, Callie for making the game. I mean, I... Yeah, it was, a, it was a team effort all, all in all, but uh, it was uh, without these people doing this, doing this by myself would have been basically impossible for me. There's certain things I'm very good at 
and uh, certain things are not. And mix all of these things together, there, there, have been, there have been problems in like two out of the five different categories, especially anything that has to do with art and graphic design. Well, there you go. That's my quote unquote review for Moonshell. This is something that if you want to pick it up and you think it's a cool game or a cool concept and it's not something you've played before or you just want to support Unfiltered Gamer for making videos, uh, there's going to be a discount code, which I'll say now, and it is Unfiltered Gamer. Oh, shocker. I think it'll give you like 20% off. It's 10% off, the, uh, $10 off the game. So from 50 to 40 bucks. And you can pick it on the website. There's not a few, uh, there's not that many copies left of the game. So if you want to pick it up before it goes away, that would be uh, great. We'll get the last few boxes out of the garage because we've just been storing them here. But it was a wonderful process. And if you've already picked up the game and you're watching the video, uh, a strong thank you because all in all, we basically broke even uh, but it was still really cool to make a game, to have a game, and have people be able to play something that we kind of created together as, 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 as partners. So, yeah, it was awesome. And you guys are awesome, too, even if you don't pick up the game. Just thanks for watching. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game not really review for our game Moonshell by Unfiltered Games. There will be a link down below in the description where you can go ahead and take a look at the game on our website. We don't have a whole lot left, so pick it up if it's something that seems interesting to you. It's not like a, I'm not making a call to action where there's only five left and you have five minutes. We have like 100 copies left, but just FYI, if it's not there by the time you're seeing this, then I apologize. We probably won't reprint it. Very unlikely, at least. Uh, additionally, too, I want to mention that Zero Day, uh, as soon as my wife gives birth, I know there's some secret news there for you, uh, we're hoping to release our next game, my game, actually, Zero Day. And uh, we'll talk about more on that project soon. If you're on Patreon, thank you, Patreon, so much for supporting us throughout this whole time with the live streams and uh, just literally everything. Uh, it helped us basically create Zero Day using a lot of the funds from that and of course a lot from my pocketbook, but it was really, really uh, appreciative. And um, yeah, you can check out Unfiltered Gamer for the 20% off the game here, uh, Moonshell. All right, that's pretty much all I got. If you want to subscribe, uh, that'd be great too, or the bell notification, or just the like button, or comment, and let us know if you've already played Moonshell. I'd like to know what you guys think. We see a lot of reviews on BGG, but I'm always happy to hear what my audience thinks. If you didn't like it, why? How can we improve on our next games? We'll make a few more, I think. Um, and we really, yeah, it's, it, I, I take all the criticisms hard. I don't ever mind criticism or don't delete comments. I just let, let me know what you guys think about the game. And hopefully I made some of you guys happy with this product. And hopefully Callie was able to make some of you guys happy as well. All right, guys, that's it. I'm done rambling. Have a great day. And as always, I look forward to seeing you guys next time.